welcome to the Big World Made Small podcast for the adventure traveler. I'm thrilled you're here. My name is Jason Elkins, and in addition to being your host, I'm also a former U.S. Army paratrooper, third-generation commercial hot air balloon pilot, paramotor pilot, ex-Montana fly fishing guide, advanced open water scuba diver, and a full-time nomad that's visited more than 30 countries on six continents. As a seasoned adventure travel expert with a passion for creating and sharing meaningful experiences, I'm on a quest to impact the lives of adventure travelers, the tour operators they rely on, and the communities that host them. Every week, I bring you exclusive interviews with fascinating adventure tourism experts who have agreed to share their personal stories, favorite destinations, and some invaluable travel insights they've picked up along the way. We'll enjoy a casual conversation, create some connections, and likely share some laughs. It's my hope that by the end of each episode, this big world will feel just a bit smaller. Let's get started, shall we? When you are 20, you always believe you are stronger than the mountain. When you are 30, it's equal. And when you are 40, you know the mountain is always going to be stronger than you. So I started to become very, very uh, afraid of just dying out there. And I remember I had these flashbacks of my family. I saw my kids growing up without me, looking back in church, looking back in in their real life in, in when they graduate from school and they were looking to this empty chair where dad should be sitting. And all these flashbacks came to me and I said like, Carl, you cannot give up right now. Don't give up right now. You are meant to come home. I had a client, he was blind, completely blind. And when we were very close to Aconcagua summit, I started to cry. And he said like, what, why are you crying? And I said, like, because we are just around the corner up there. And he said, yeah, but you've been so many times up here. And I said, yeah, but I'm here with you. And I feel so special because you are here. And he said, like, Carl, you are making me cry. And I said, but you can't cry. You don't have eyes. And then he said, like, Carl, describe me what you see. And I was trying to share him what I see. It's like beautiful. It goes down like three, four thousand feet. And I was describing everything and he was kind of spreading his hands and trying to fill it with his with his fingers. And I came back to base camp and I said, I regret, Carl, that you always said that you climb mountains because you want to see what's up there. You have to say, I climb mountains because I want to feel what it's out there. It's completely different. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Big World Made Small Adventure Travel Podcast. Happy to have each and every one of you back here today. Today, we've got a real treat. We've got Carl Eckloff from Cumbre Tours, Ecuador with us today. Uh, Carl, welcome to the show. Happy to have you here. Thank you, Jason. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time. It's an absolutely pleasure to talk about Ecuador, about uh, my athlete career, and, and yeah, uh, discover beautiful things uh, surrounding the mountains and everything. Well, you're you're very passionate. I remember our first conversation, you were telling me some stuff that I just it wasn't even on my radar. I did not. I mean, I, I know that people climb mountains. I did not realize that it was kind of a race to the top type of thing. And that's something you have really done quite a bit of and excited to share some of that kind of some of your stories and really kind of, you know, what this whole career of yours has has done for your personal development, your just uh, kind of understanding the world, share it with, with, with all of us. That would be super wonderful. So, so, so happy to have you here. And... Before we jump into, jump, in, I'm not sure jump into is the right word, but before we get into all your feats of mountaineering, really just want to connect with you as a person and share your story because I, I find that everybody that does this type of stuff has some sort of interesting twist in the beginning or they just were born into it and it's in their blood. So I'd love to have you share with the listeners, you know, how did you get from where you were to where you are now? What did that journey look like? Well, thanks for asking. Um, well, I was born here in Ecuador. I, I have a Swiss father. He was always involved in mountaineering. He used to guide a lot. So he took me out to the mountains when I was very young. I don't even remember how old I was. I just have uh, seen so many pictures. Uh, he carried me on his back and taking me to the highlands and to the glacier. And sometimes I talk to my dad and said, Dad, it was a bit, uh, you know, like not not really... Not really like what you're expecting for a father, a bit irresponsible taking me so young to the mountains. But 
uh, of course, it changed my life. Um, I was kind of born to do this. Uh, he brought me out there very young and I started joining him even in my school days every weekend. Uh, and my father used to guide a lot. So he always said to me, as soon as we have Saturday or Sunday, you're just coming with me. I have some people to guide and you just can come and follow. And uh, this is why I, I was introduced to the mountains very early. And uh, my wish to become a mountain guy was always there since since I, I I was a teenager. I always was kind of figuring out what it takes to become a mountain guide, an international mountain guide, and and uh, this is the, this is the reason why I started with mountaineering because normally local people here in Ecuador they are not much involved with mountaineering. It's much more in, uh, tourists who are coming here to climb our mountains, and uh, this is why I I started early and uh, I lost my mom when I was young uh, sh I was just 15 years old so that changed a bit because after losing my mom my father uh, sent us to Switzerland because uh, studies are then for free and uh, we continued our our journey studying university and and everything there in Switzerland so I was uh, missing a lot uh, my lifestyle in Ecuador. I was missing a lot guiding. I was missing a lot the nature and everything, even if Switzerland has it all also. But I, I was living in, in, in the big city. I didn't have the access to go to the mountains there. So I, I came back to Ecuador every single year while I was there. And I was always joining his expeditions and all. And uh, as soon as I came back to Ecuador uh, to make my living here, um, it was, I was 26 I started uh, my guiding career. I started to have all the courses to become an international mountain guide. And this is how I always was close and have been close to the mountains. Uh, and of course, later I discovered speed climbing and doing records and all that. But this is just one part of car. The other part of car was mountaineering as a lifestyle. And um, yeah, I just always try to be there and, and teach my kids the same lifestyle and going camping there and enjoying nature and admire the wildlife there and everything. That's a, that's a very cool story. And first, I want to acknowledge losing your mom at a young age. I'm, I can't even imagine what that would have been like. And then, I, I guess it's in my words, going off to Switzerland. So you, you kind of, that's a big transition, both with, you know, with losing your mom and then going to a new place I can imagine would have been quite challenging. So, so it sounds like your father stayed and continued to run his guiding business, mountaineering business. You went off to Switzerland, spent some time there and came back. Okay. I'm, I'm curious. So early on, cause I'm envisioning you like in a backpack <laughs> being hauled up the mountains by your father. What did your mom think about that early on? I'm, I'm always, always interested in how, you know, people that work in this business, how that impacts their relationships. So I'm, I'm trying to imagine your, your relationship, I guess your mom's relationship with your dad early on when she was taking you off into the mountains. How, how did that go? Well, this is an, an amazing question because uh, my mom was always very conservative and my mom always said, like, take care of my son. And, and uh, my father's well, most, most moms do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> most moms do. And actually, this is kind of normal. And uh, I always was the one. Uh, asking my mom and begging my mom to let my father take me with him. And I was always saying like, I won't be claiming, I won't be willing to go home. Uh, I will be, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I, I will not disturb him while he's working. This was kind of the, the big thing. Of course, we were not just out there, dad and son and having a dad son time. No, I was there to, to help him or to come be and kind of be a, a yeah, kind of a, a ghost. He that did not want to be, out there with a the son who is asking where are we going home or how many hours do we still have to walk or all that stuff. So my father always said, like, if you want to come with me, you have to be kind of a military son. Yeah, just to be quiet and walk. And uh, I, I, I always loved that. I always came back home. And I remember on a Sunday, my mother said, that, but don't forget to do homework and don't forget to be a good student and everything. And I was already Tuesday asking, where are we going next weekend? And my mom said, like, I just focus on school. Okay. And I said, yeah, but uh, I, I want to come with him to the big mountains. And my father always said like, yeah, but you are a bit too, 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 too young to, to do the big volcanoes. It's too high. It's dangerous for your lungs and everything. So since I was 12, I was begging him to take me to the big ones. And my father said, as soon as you become 15, 
you will come with me. So I was waiting long. And uh, until I became 15, I, I joined him uh, to the very first Cotopaxi tour, which is a tough mountain here. It's not technical, but it's a, a very high and tall mountain. So I felt the altitude. I struggled all the way up. And I remember when I arrived to the summit, I said to my father, why do people lo- like this? This is like uh, so, so heavy and so strong. And then, uh, I went home and I was, I was remembered like a nightmare out there. And uh, the next morning I woke up and I said to my dad, when are you taking me again? And he said like, but you did, you did say something completely different yesterday. And I said, yeah, yeah, but I already slept and I'm ready to go. So he said, you have already the guiding mentality. So it's just uh, a matter of time. And he immediately started to focus me. And he said like, okay, if you want to be a mountain guide, you have to do this and this and this and this and develop your languages, develop your skills, do all the courses, do an international certification and everything and have always a plan B and everything. So actually I was, I was brought to the mountaineering scene um, because of my dad. I'm thankful because normally here in Ecuador, as I said, it's, it's difficult to, kind of have this connection directly. Was he a mountain guide in Switzerland earlier no. or did when did he start getting into the guiding and mountaineering? Well, he was never a guide. He was um he was always uh, working with furniture. Um he's a carpenter and uh he came to Ecuador very young. He was 18 years old when he came to Ecuador and he felt immediately in love in Ecuador. Uh, he, he actually met my mom in Switzerland because she, she was Ecuadorian, but she went for studies in Switzerland. They're, they're, mm-hmm. That's the reason why they met. And they came here to Ecuador very young, both 18 and 20. And my father started a, a furniture company here, but he was always involved in mountaineering because, of course, uh, big companies from abroad were always looking for people who were talking their language. So my father was always very close to the Swiss embassy, to the German embassy. And this is how he was always recommended. And of course, he was a strong guy. He woke. He actually grew up in the in the Alps. He was very strong, but he never did kind of a, a certification as a mountain guide. Those days, there were no not many uh, ways to become an international mountain guide or even a local mountain guide. You just were out there and you knew what you knew. But experience, of course, things changed. And today, it's very hard to become an international mountain guide. This is why I. When I start learning from him, uh, it was basics. And then at a short, certain point, he, he knew that I, I needed other people to teach me and other level of, of, of uh, knowledge. And this is why I, I started in the best uh, international school uh, as, as a mountain guide. So I, I'm able to guide ever, everywhere worldwide. But of course, the roots of all that were because of my dad. That's a... That's a- Pretty cool story. And I and to relate to that. I remember, you know, it's I think you and I you, you might be a little younger and definitely in a lot better shape than me. And um you won't you won't have any problem beating me to the top of the moon, let's put it that way. And when when I was growing up, my grandfather, when I look back at it, now I realize he was a guy to take people hunting. And it was the same thing through through work connections. Everybody knew that he was a, a hunter and liked to go up in the mountains and he would get out of state. People would come and go hunting with him. I'm not sure they even had guide licenses or any of the any of the requirements back then. So things, yeah, things have shifted a little bit. It's uh, now we've got technology and internet, and and I can appreciate why some countries or municipalities might not want people putting themselves out there as guides without some some certifications and training. So I, I get that completely. I'm curious. So what I heard you say was, I was always begging mom, mom, I want to go with dad. I want to go with dad. Dad, take me with you. Take me with you. And I'm sure there were times when she just said no. <laughs> and I'm envisioning, because I, I know me, I, I can envision me just being a total pain in her butt when, uh, when I was left behind to almost to like, not manipulate, but you know how kids are. Kids are like, I don't want to be here. You didn't let me go with dad. I'm going to show you. So did you do that on those those times when you didn't get to go with dad? Do you remember what was what was the weekend at home with mom like when you wanted to be on the mountain? Well, it's a funny story because I, I'm the youngest of three kids and I have two older sisters. So my sisters, they have girl times. Um, they were always with mom doing girl stuff. And I always said to my mom, what should I do if I don't go to the mountains? Should I? Uh, play with the ball against the, the wall or what should I do 
And and she said, like, I don't know, do something. And I said, like, I, I don't want to be staying here asking you 10,000 10, times what I should do as a boy. And uh, she always agreed and said, okay, just go with your father. Okay, just take care and come back home and be ha happy. So uh, these discussions were not, not, not too long because I was a good boy. I always came back and I promised mom to help her out in the kitchen. I was always like kind of having this balance. And I was always the one begging. Of course, probably would have turned differently if, if, if dad would have been the one pressuring me and, and I was the one telling in secret to my mom, don't give me allowance to go there because I don't want to go there. It's different. But of course, I was the one like begging and putting my arms together and saying like, please let me go, let me go, let me go. So, and of course, in my room, in the entire wall, mountain pictures were were hanging and and I was asking that. My mother was always like, would, would you like to watch television with, with your sisters? And I said, no, no, girl stuff. So I, I just want to, I want my dad to tell me stories about mountaineering. And my father always said like, I don't have so many stories I give you some magazines and, and all that stuff. So I was always very curious, like what's out there. I always was asking like that, are there other mountains besides the ones we have here higher? And he said like, yeah, there are tons of mountains. And I said like, and where and how high and how difficult? And my father always said like, I don't know. I don't know. Don't ask too much. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty cool. And you mentioned a couple of things that I, I'm just going to let's, let's have this conversation because I just mentioned something about, you know, times have changed. We were talking about how times have changed in the guiding and, and tourism, but they've also changed in the definition of girl things. And I feel like I'd be remiss to stop you there um, and have that conversation because as part of the podcast, for example, we've been, you know, I've interviewed some, some women that basically their story is the same, whether it was with their mom, their dad, I've interviewed uh, male guides who got into it with their, you know, grew up with a single mom. And she was out guiding people, uh, specifically in Ecuador, I remember a story. So I, I just wanted to kind of address that because as you've been going through your life and you're you're married now, right? Yes, I am. Okay, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your wife. Is she outdoorsy? Do um, I'm sure you've been on the, out on the mountains. I'm sure you know women climbers that are probably just as athletic as, as or driven as you are. So, so... Okay. Let's let's do fair justice here and and talk about that here just a little bit too if you don't mind. No, absolutely, absolutely. This is absolutely right. Actually, uh, just to 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 go backwards, my sisters they were brought to the mountains too. Actually, my father took them took us all three, but they didn't like it too much. Uh, probably because they started late as teenagers and uh, they didn't enjoy it too much and uh of course when he was discussing at home uh who wants to come uh, i was the only one raising the hand and and then uh, i had the opportunity of course the opportunity yeah. was there and the, the yeah. funny thing is that like many years later uh my sisters came to me and said like you know everyone in the streets asked me if eglof has to, to do to do something with carl eglof and i said yeah yeah, and why why are you asking me that? Because I don't know. I, it's my kind of my responsibility to climb big mountains too, because I have the same name. And I said, and I said, oh, well, this is funny. You are you kind of asking me to bring you up there? And and they said like, yeah, actually, but not your rhythm. But take us up there. We have to we have to climb big mountains too, because we we are we are Eglof. And I said, yeah, of course, I take you up there. So I trained them. And uh, we made it up to Cotopaxi. It was a beautiful, beautiful journey. I enjoyed it. Probably I enjoyed it more than them. But um, it, it, for them, it was life-changing. They have this beautiful picture on their living room. And of course, I met my wife uh, in the mountains because my probably it's the only kind of woman they're going to understand, the mountain guy. So, uh, I thought that might be the case. We didn't discuss that last time we spoke, but I had a feeling that it probably went that direction. So you met her in the mountains. Tell us that story. Yeah, absolutely. She hired me to take her up to the mountains. And then, of course, I, I did what guides shouldn't do. I dated my my client. And uh, then, <laughs> yeah, we, we had a relationship. It was beautiful. We climbed many years together. Of course, she, in one point of the life, we became parents. And, uh, and then the things become a little bit different. Uh, someone had to stay with the kids. We tried to to have a balance on it. And as I do a living out of it, of course, I'm more in the mountains, but of course, in some free time, we try to go together. And she, she, as our kids are still small, 
We are really looking forward to plan together and do some mountaineering together. And of course, uh, I'm a father of a daughter too, not just of a son. And, um, and the big question is, uh, would you allow your daughter to climb mountains? Of course, I can't wait. I want her to destroy all my records and, uh, and uh, I will be the first father cheering. And I definitely believe a lot in woman power. I've, in my years as a guide, I always figured out that women have a stronger mind than, than men. Men give easily up and they probably are physically stronger, but women are very tough. They are fighters. And uh, being father of a son and a daughter, it's beautiful because uh, you can compare it. And my my daughter is always, I mean, she's two years old and she's already wearing my helmets. And um, it's just beautiful to see that. Is that it's 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 super cool to see that generational thing. I've I've got I'm a third generation balloon pilot, so I had some experience similar. I was traveling with my father in the summers, going to balloon festivals, learning how to fly ballooning, and I was the same way. That's all I wanted to talk about was ballooning. <laughs> the whole like eight or nine months that I was back in school with my mom, it was like I was can't wait to go ballooning, can't wait to go ballooning, and. And now with my son, and I've got a son and daughter as well that I trust will both be fourth generation pilots at some point. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty cool to share that. And I actually got back. I, got, I was out of ballooning for quite a while, and then I decided to get back into it because I wanted to have that experience with my kids and share that with them. And I'm so so happy that that I did that as well. So that's um, I, I get that. So, and your your kids are probably already like climbing all over everything in the house. I'm sure. I, I can, I'm mad. <laughs> yeah, but when we when we have visitors, they always look at me like, "Are you allowing this?" Like she's uh, jumping on the sofa and making uh, and making huge and risk things, risky things. But I know that she it's just on her blood, and I'm just so happy. And I'm the the first one congratulating her every time she. She she does something spectacular on, in in home climbing a wall or whatever. I, it's on the genes, I guess. <laughs> well, it is. I think you know. I'm a firm believer in kind of um, nature and nurture. I think it's a good mix, and I also believe that a lot of people squash that ambition in their children pretty quickly. Not because they don't love their kids, and not because they're trying to hold them back. It's probably is because they love their kids. So they, you know, they worry about, oh, you're going to get hurt. Don't do that. Don't do this. So by the time the kids are 15, 18 or so, when they start to kind of you know, typically want to kind of pull away and go do their own thing, they feel very limited by the way they were raised. So even if they've got the genes, mm -hmm. if they don't have the modeling at home or if they're not given the opportunity to take those risks, and unfortunately, it's not just physical danger risks it's everything because if you're constantly told don't do this don't do this don't do this um your default becomes a no it's mm -hmm. like i'm going to be socially ostracized i'm going to get hurt i'm going to not fit into maybe the story that i've created in my head of what my parents want for me so i'd love that even when other people come over and question you you're like no this is this and and obviously your parents um allowed you to do that as well so anybody that's listening to this with young kids don't let them do really really stupid stuff but let them do enough stupid stuff Absolutely. that they that they develop a pattern of willingness to try things because that's the key they'll figure out what things work and don't work you don't but telling them it won't work before they've even given it a try is just it, it really stunts them in my in my opinion so absolutely i agree with you yeah wise word Tell us a little bit about your journey on the athletic side of it, getting to the top, and what drove you to want to be the quickest one to the top. Tell us some stories. What What is that all about? Well, um, I was always involved in sports very early in age. I was always uh, the one who wanted the, the best uh, notes, the best uh, uh, rates when I was out there in school. I always wanted to be the, the captain of all the teams and being uh, in, in, in the in the track team, I wanted to be in the football team, I wanted to be everywhere. And when my mom always said like, yeah, but you should have like other good notes, like math and chemic and everything. And I always said, no, 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 sports, sports, just the best one in sports. And my mom said, yeah, but you're not coming very far with sports. And I said like, I will show you, I will show you. I was always challenging my mom. And- um, Did she want it, Carl, I wanna pause you there for just a second. 
Mm-hmm. Is that that's interesting? What do you know, or what do you feel like she really wanted you to do with your life? Because she came from a from a, actually from a generation where athletes uh, were just very few out there, and uh, the chances to become one in in an, uh, in an undeveloped country like Ecuador were small very small and of course your mom wants to protect you and we had the same situation today early this breakfast exactly the same my son had to write down what he, what what he wants to become when he when he's an adult and he wanted to write football player and, my, and mom said like are you crazy this is not a career and, and i was i was there what well, did you just look at her you give her the glare or how did, I, how did I, that go? I wasn't allowed to to say a word because of course I would have seen, yes, of course you want to become the next Cristiano Ronaldo, go for it. But so mom said like that, you just don't say a word out there. <laughs> and it was just me watching myself. I grew up exactly like that. And I remember the coaches always coming to my mom and telling her that like, I'm, I'm very talented. And my mom always said like, don't tell him, don't tell him, don't tell him because he's going to drop everything. And then my mom left and the, and the trainer said like, Carl, your mom didn't don't want you to become better and don't want you to to come to a, a, a specific school like uh, I have athlete school and so on. And I always uh, was mad with my mom, but of course I understand her. Today I'm I'm a yeah. parent too. I you want the best for your kids, and it's hard and, being a parent. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe maybe even a little harder for moms. I'll just say it that way. Yeah, I get it. Absolutely, yeah. I I think so too. But coming to your question, I was always involved in sport, and I was always successful in sport. I was competing in the very highest level as a soccer player. Um, and then I changed to mountain biking. I was always very focused competing. I was in world championships. I was representing Ecuador in more than nine years in international races as a mountain biker. And then I switched to speed climber. But all this journey. Uh, I never left the mountain behind. I always was involved in mountains. I always was guiding in mountains. I always was doing my courses as a mountain guide. And I was doing mountaineering as a, as a living. And definitely when I changed to speed climbing, it was a bit a coincidence because I didn't know there was a sport out there called speed climbing. And uh, when I... I didn't I, know there was until I first yeah, met you, Carl. It's It's quite normal. In certain cultures, it's very big. Spain, France, Italy, this is kind of the mecca for all these sports. But when I was beating all the records here, running up and down Corpaxi, Cayambe, Chimborazo, and all these Ecuadorian beautiful volcanoes, I didn't know there were people li- making a, out a living of it and uh, being absolutely professional and sponsored and everything. And this is when the very first time I, I was watching them on YouTube and seeing like they have special and specific gear. They have like everything is ultra light and carbon gear and everything. And I, I become smarter. I was watching them. And then, of course, I said I should go for a big project. And this is how I started with speed climbing. And and, and actually, in, in a very few time, a very few months, I was already out there internationally trying to beat all these records and and uh, I, I was, I was successful. I have done fourteen world records out there. But of course, I'm, I'm a, a father of two kids, and I'm uh, running my tourism travel agency here in Ecuador. And uh, I know that sport is not my main source, and won't never be, uh, because I'm already forty two years old. But I still have this healthy life. I train every day. I still, ha- I'm very good in shape. But of course. It's not like a football career where you're just training three times a day and nothing else matters. Uh, I'm just doing sports in a very high level, but um, my main source is still my family with uh, with my travel agency and with all the tours and guidings that I'm doing. And I still do some projects in, in speed and everything, trying not to risk too much because always too much can be discussable. But uh I try to have this healthy balance right now. Do you, do you make it clear to your potential guide clients that you've got this background in speed climbing? And do you feel that sometimes they're intimidated by that? Because <laughs> yeah, I can imagine a scenario where I'm like, okay, I want to climb X mountain. But I don't want to go with the guy that's going to go the fastest or that I'm not going to be able to keep up with or I'm going to feel embarrassed. 
Um, so how do you over, I'm just curious, how do you overcome that with your clients? Does that come up very often or, or are you the one that's like, come on, we got to go? Well, this is a very precise and good uh, question, Jason, because it always happens when they don't know me. That means they have heard about my achievements and they don't know me as a human. As soon yeah. as I'm there, with which is that, why we're, which is why we're here, Carl. Exactly. So exactly. we can get to know and you as a human. <laughs> people believe that I'm just a robot out there or a machine out there. And as soon as I arrive, I'm going to pull them up to the summit to be back home to train. And that's not the way I, I never stop guiding because they, they put my, my feet uh, very, very down to earth. And I love to guide. I, I really enjoy it. Even if, if I climb Kolobaksi in an hour and 26 minutes, I can do it in 19 hours too. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. And, and I enjoy it to be out there because I don't do it because of the money. I just do it because I love this lifestyle and I love the mountains. And this is why I love uh, to work with also very, very special cases. For example, I, I guide every year amputees uh, that had struggled really a lot to walk. And, and, and it's beautiful to to guide them, even if we have three times more than it, it, any other client out there, it's just to be out there and help others to achieve their dreams. And something that I, it's beautiful for me is that I I never stop guiding because many people say to be efficient in sport, you have to focus on on certain pulse and certain training and certain rhythm and everything. And I always said, yeah, besides my work, I will, but my work is guiding. And uh, it's funny because I try to split my year in uh, different uh, objectives. Sometimes I have three, four months just focused on guiding. And then I have three, four months focused on my projects. So I try to have all this balance uh, where I'm more at home and sometimes I'm more guiding. And of course, to answer your questions, they are always very intimidated. And the agency, sometimes it's it, they don't want to publish anything related with my records because they say, Every time I put Carl is going to be the guide, they 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 are asking if there's someone else. <laughs> they, there's someone slower on the team that would be the, I, exactly I, I, someone someone who is willing to have a beer and start to run. But it's okay, it's absolutely okay until they know me. As soon as they know yeah. me, it's beautiful because they know that I, I I will definitely not be running away. I'm there. I'm very passionate. I love to be there. And of course, in my free time, I go jogging, but this isn't, that this doesn't change anything. They are resting, they are reading, they're recovering. So it's a good balance. It's interesting because it really is two different. Well, I'm seeing it as two different things. One, like you said, is the athleticism of, you know, trying to push yourself to maybe break some records, hit some personal goals. And the other is guiding. That is, those are two totally different things in my mind, unless maybe you've got somebody who wants to also break some records and hires you to help them or coach you or train them. But that's not really guiding. That's that's coaching, I, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because if you, let's say you were a, maybe just, maybe marathon runner's too close for a good analogy, but if you were, you know, a, a soccer player, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, professional athlete, soccer player that also was a mountain guide, you wouldn't have probably all that, right? You'd still be the same type. You're still doing your things for different reasons, mm -hmm. two different reasons, but maybe people would not make the connection and think, oh, geez, how can, can he really be a good guide if he's always in such a hurry to get to the top? Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to ask that question or, or have this conversation a little bit. So anybody that is listening to this, um, cause what I hear you saying is you see it as two different things. And when you're with type clients, it's, you know, you're writing them, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. What's you mentioned a cup, you mentioned a couple things. You mentioned amputees, you mentioned some other things. If you were to summarize what your favorite part of the guiding is into a sense or two, what would that, what would that sound like? I think it's exactly that moment when they are willing to give up. And you encourage them and to say, like, don't give up. It's not far away. We can still do it. Just step by step, focus. We will do it. And then it's the guide who is encouraging and encouraging and just trying to, to give them some, some power. And then on the end, they achieve their, 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 their summit and they start to cry. And then it's all worth it. All this effort. So maybe, so maybe there is some coaching mixed in there. Maybe I, <laughs> maybe I discounted that a little bit because what I just heard was some some coaching as well, which I'm sure in mountain climbing is an important important consideration. 
what is your, I'm sure that in your speed climbing, I'm sure that you've had some experiences, presumably that weren't so pleasant, or it depends on how you look at the world. I, I get that. But maybe share an experience or a memory with us that maybe I would think, oh man, that sounds horrible. Maybe your mindset is it's different than mine, but I'm, you know, can you, do you have a story that pops into your mind of, of yeah. a day when maybe you wish you weren't doing that or, or well, you're really happy you were doing it because you pushed through it? <laughs> sometimes we, we push too hard and sometimes uh, the mind of an athlete is uh, hard as a stone. And sometimes um, it comes out that you are just a human and you can become very weak out there. So uh, I remember last year, May 2022, I was climbing together with my climbing and rope partner, Nicolas Miranda, from base camp to the summit of Makalu, which is the fifth tallest mountain in the world. Um, we wanted to be the very, the very first humans to do a base camp, summit base camp without sleeping in any camp, just uh, one single push without the use of uh, artificial oxygen. Um, it was already like a huge, a huge achievement just to think about it, because uh, if nobody has done it so far, it's because of something. It's definitely not a walk in the park. So when we planned everything in perfection, we did all these rotations and we went up and down many times to different camps. And then the, the, the big day came and we started to be like push ourselves to the very limit. And we are, we achieved uh, our dream to to summit uh, before record time uh, up there yeah. on the summit. It was beautiful. Uh, it's difficult to describe it in a few words, but definitely it's a childhood dream to be up there in the Himalayas and breaking a world record. And kind of, yeah, your big dream is done. But on the same time, in a second, something came to my head and said, like, Carl, you are so tired. How are you going down? Yeah, it's the death zone. You are not with any oxygen on your backpack. Uh, you are so tired. I was vomiting every 10 meters. Um, I was I was looking uh, out there and have hallucinations. People were out there that didn't exist. I was seeing ghosts and everything. And I said to myself, wow, I have to, to descend to base camp in a mountain that I'm not even able to walk 10 feet. So I started to become very, very um, afraid of, yeah, just dying out there. And I remember I had these flashbacks of my family. I saw my kids growing up without me, looking back in church, looking back in, in their real life in, in, when they graduate from school and they were looking to this empty chair where dad should be sitting. And all these flashbacks came to me and I said, like, Carl, you cannot give up right now. Don't give up right now. You are meant to come home. And all these record things are just no important right now. It just focus yourself. And I was sleeping when I was walking down. And my teammate was exactly the same, struggling with the same ghosts and with the same issues as I was. So I, we started to team up and we were trying to watch our backs and trying to, okay, if you want to sit down and and take a breath. The other one is really focused, so we are not sleeping together. And the other, the other one is standing up, the other one is feeding you, and so on. So we tried to really do a good teamwork. And on the end, we did it. We went down, and we we it was probably the, the, the heaviest and strongest thing I've ever done in my life because I was feeling my stomach so hard from summit to base cup almost 10 hours, vomiting all the time. And and yeah, sitting down and I slept while I was walking and everything. But as soon as you arrive to base camp, it was not that feeling of, yeah, we did it. That's a world record. We just smashed it. No, I just thought it was a bit too risky. It was probably the very first time I saw that. I saw that it's going to be over. So definitely was a, a crazy experience. And I I remember when I arrived, I the only and only thing I wanted to do is just text my wife to say I'm okay and she can sleep in peace because I'm I'm back in base camp and everything else is just a, an extra time and and everything. Wow, that's found. <laughs> this is it. Do you think if you didn't have a family come waiting for you? Do you think that might have changed the outcome? 
I don't think so, but definitely it's a, it's a force. Um, of course, you want to be the best out there, uh, but sometimes we, we think we are stronger than we are. And uh, sometimes you think, yeah, yeah, this is just as soon as I'm there, I will figure out how to how to handle that situation. And sometimes you are just, yeah, out of power. You are just a human and uh, humans can get sick and um, things can get got, get out of control. I can tell you three, four other stories that always were very limited to success and death. And uh, of course, this is something that we always discuss at home and we say, okay, so how far are you going to push? And uh, I think this is very important as a professional extreme sport athlete to know that you are not crazy, that you are strong and that you, just, you train strong and you do uh, big things, but on the same time, never cross the border of death having a family or having someone to come back. And yeah, it, I'm not just out there to die. I'm out there to, to, to know my limits and to know how hard I can push. But definitely when you are 40 and older, you know that your body can get weak. You, you don't recover easily anymore. So you start to think a bit different. When you are 20, you always believe you are stronger than the mountain. When you are 30, it's equal. And when you are 40, you know the mountain is always going to be stronger than you. That's Thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah, I'm well, happy well. I asked. I'm happy I asked the question. <laughs> um, it, it there's so many more questions rolling around in my head. <laughs> um, so the story you just shared. When your wife listens to this podcast, will she say, "Oh yeah, I've heard all that before," or is there going to be something there that she's like, "Oh, you didn't tell me that." Of course, I didn't exaggerate too much when I was describing myself out there. I said like I was, it was tough, but it was okay. But of course, uh, she didn't know that I was crying and I was really thinking with all these flashbacks. And uh, it's it's delicate to tell too many details because at the end we are a family, we have kids, and uh yeah. i don't want to be like a silly dad to risk too much but definitely uh, it was a good experience for me good in in of course. well here let's let's in case she does listen to this let's give her something good to take away from it so what have you decided what did you decide to change or what have you decided to change going forward to make sure you don't find yourself in that situation again definitely team up with the right people uh, then do a proper acclimatization because it was an issue of altitude and uh, definitely be mentally prepared and have always a plan B. That means always having a solution if problems come in and uh, don't just get it, give it as granted that you're going to do everything perfect in plane A. That means you have always someone that could rescue or you have someone there watching you or there is a radio communication here and there and of course as every relationship we decided to do it to a certain point that means in my case i said i want to do this and this and then it's over and then i want to be a good father and do their dreams and go for their dreams or her dreams and not just be the athlete life the rest of my life because it's not fair it's a it's a family. It's not just a one-man show. You're welcome. Not sure, where to, not sure where to go after that. That's. Um, I hope she does listen to this. She will. I she just, will. I suspect, that she already, <laughs> I suspect she already knows that you love her and your family. And, Absolutely. and I hear it in your voice. And I am fortunate to be sitting here looking at your face as you tell the story as well. And um yeah, I think that she'll appreciate hearing that in your voice as well. I'm sure she's heard it many times, but <laughs> thank yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. <laughs> Something a little lighter. <laughs> Speaking about high altitude, <laughs> light air. Um, Ella, you have a story with, with clients and hopefully one that's not going to scare away your potential clients from uh, from going with you in the future. But I'm sure you have some some funny, interesting. You don't need to mention any names, but um, what's one of your most memorable, favorite experiences? Maybe you already alluded to it earlier with with clients. Well, I guess uh, clients 
I've been able to play, to guide clients from all over the world. And sometimes it's, 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 uh, it comes the question, like, how do you feel to climb the same mountain 500 times and still smile? And I said, Good question. The, 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 the answer is easy. Every single human is different. Um, every single experience is different. Every single day out there is different, but I always, and I still cry every single time when I arrive to the summit. And uh, it's funny because sometimes they don't even cry and because they are so wasted that I say, no, I, I, I'm, I'm so destroyed. I, I'm probably going to cry when I'm back home, but I'm the one crying always. And um, it's, it's, it's funny because uh, sometimes it's different, difficult to describe, but it's the reason what, why we climb is to see what it's what's out there. When you arrive to the summit, it's just beautiful to to see what's out there. And I remember I had a client; he was blind, completely blind, hmm. and uh, he lost both eyes uh, because of cancer. And then he contacted me and he said, "I want to climb them all. I want to climb the tallest peaks everywhere." And we were arriving to Akokawa Summit. He was a, he is a so a strong guy. He did just the seven summits. He climbed Everest recently. He's a machine. He has done uh, Ironmans, everything. And he cannot see anything. He has, uh, yeah, two prosthetic wow. eyes. And when we were very close to Akonkawa Summit, I started to cry. And he said, like, what, why are you crying? And I said, like, because we are just around the corner up there. And he said, yeah, but you've been so many times up here. And I said, yeah, but I'm here with you. And I feel so special because you are here. And he said, like, Carl, you are making me cry. And I said, but you can't cry. You don't have eyes. You're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> and then he started He started to really cry. And, and then uh, we were hugging each other. And I remember when we, we did the last steps to the summit, I hugged him and he was, like, very, very sensitive. And he said, like, Carl, describe me. Why are you so passionate of being in the summit because I can't see. So describe me what you see. And I said, like, I had, I got, you know, like I had a school scheme and I said, like, you are in the top of the world right now. There is uh, just the Himalayas higher than Aconcagua. And, and uh, we are here together. You are blind. You are showing the world that blindness is definitely not a discapacity. This is that you can climb everything what you want. And, um, yeah, thank you for letting me be part of it. And he said, like, Carl, if you if you wouldn't exist, I wouldn't be here. So it was a, a beautiful conversation, and I was trying to share him what I see. And I said, like, if you look here, it's like, whoa, it's like beautiful. It goes down like three, four thousand feet, and 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 the wind comes in and describe it. Describe me as if, if you would describe it to your son. And I was describing everything and he was kind of spreading his hands and trying to feel it with his, with his fingers. And I came back to base camp and I said, I regret, Carl, that you always said that you climb mountains because you want to see what's up there. You have to say, I climb mountains because I want to feel what it's out there. It's completely different. And uh, this client made me change absolutely my, my, my speech <laughs> and my, of course, and my mentality. Man. That's um, that's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm thinking one thing. I'm thinking is we should probably interview him on the show as well. Yeah, you have to. We, I want to hear like I want to hear his side of the story. Absolutely, and I'm sure it's just as impactful. And I've long been a believer, and this is, this is kind of proof or at least validation of my story in my head is that you know adventure travel is not about the mountains or the islands or the I like to say beaches, but you know what I mean? It's not a, or the rivers. Um, I was a fly fishing guide. It wasn't about the fish. It wasn't about the river. It's really about the connection. Sometimes maybe with the adventure, you know, the speed climbing, maybe it's the connection with self. It's a connection with competitors. I'm not sure because that's way outside of my area of expertise. But with the guiding for sure. And I think every guide that listens to this program, every real guide that's like, heart and soul guide is going to resonate with that story you just told. And they'll all be like, Oh, wow. I, he just put into words how I feel mm -hmm. um, when I'm with my clients. Cause I remember, you know, I was a fishing guide and people were like, wow, you fish the same river every day, you know, the same drift boat, the same, generally the same river, 
sometimes I see the same fish. Um, but it was never like that for me. It's like, no, every day, you know, even if the weather is the same and the water clarity is the same, I'm with somebody different. Um, sometimes I'd guide uh, somebody for three or four days. And each one of those days was different because the stage of the relationship between me and them had changed. The first day is one dynamic. By the third day, we're talking about things that have nothing to do with fishing. Absolutely. Um, and you just, you did a really, really great job of kind of summarizing that. And especially with your client who's blind, that's even more evidence. It's not about the mountain. It's not about the view from the top. It's it's about the connection that you just described that you don't get that sitting on a fruit tip, sitting on a beach somewhere, drinking cocktails, um, work, you know, in, in, in a traditional job in your work. Yes, maybe. Um, so that's, I, I really appreciate you, appreciate you sharing that. Um, I feel like we could probably do a, a podcast about every step that you've guided and a bunch of other things. And I'm curious, is there, I feel like I asked some really good questions or I got some really good answers. It wasn't because I asked the right questions, but I got some great stuff. So thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else I should have asked or that you feel like our listeners need to know either about about you, Carl, about your guide business. We didn't really talk a whole lot about that. Um, so share with us whatever you want the listeners of the show to to know about you or any parting thoughts or anything that you want to share. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Well, um, you're very welcome to join us anytime here to Ecuador or to the world. Uh, we offer tours in Ecuador and we offer tours worldwide to the biggest and tallest mountains in the world. I, use, I try to guide them personally as a tour guide with all my team and you'll be very welcome to come here to Ecuador too. Uh, there are beautiful things to see Ecuador, like the Switzerland of, of Latin America with like beautiful sanaries and everything. Uh, and also as an athlete, you can follow me on social media uh, as Carl Eglov or as Cumbre Tours. Uh, and also, if you just want an advice to start climbing or you've never done it before and you just want to know uh, what I think about these shoes or this training or whatever, I'm always there to answer you all the questions. And, and I'm just happy that other people start to discover these beautiful mountains and sandwiches. Thank you for asking that, Jason. It was beautiful talking to you, definitely. Thank you, Carl. Really, really appreciate you. We will have your link to your website and then you'll have some, and you mentioned your social media as well. So um, anybody that's listening to this, Carl, just that was a pretty great offer to to connect and support um, the listeners as well. And Carl, does your, does Bloomberg Tours also do non-climbing stuff? Are you able to set up tours with the combination of other natural, cultural stuff as well, or is it only climbing? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, we are we are based here in Ecuador, but we are pretty everywhere right now in South America. We offer tours, trekking tours, uh, culture tours. We do, of course, high altitude mountaineering tours. We do pretty everything, um, and um, regionally, also worldwide, we do all the Everest space camp trekking, Kilimanjaro, Europe, and Aconcagua, and all this stuff. So very welcome, and even if you just want to contact us for an advice we are also there so uh, that's wonderful well i will share real quick before we before we wrap it up i had spoken with somebody else another tour operator in ecuador as well that had an interest in mountaineering and i mentioned your name i won't mention his name because i didn't ask for permission but i mentioned your name and his i was on a zoom call like we are now and his eyes just got big around like like uh, silver dollars he's like uh, Carl, I, I love Carl. Carl's a great guy. And that's from another tour operator um, in Ecuador. And so you, you're making it. And he, it was very clear that you had mentored him in some of his climbing. And just uh, so anybody listening to this remotely interested in, in climbing or just connection, really, because again, it's not about the mountain, I would encourage you to reach out to Carl and his team. So Carl, thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was fascinating. Um, I really appreciate you opening up and sharing kind of the, the letting us behind the curtain a little bit. Thank you. You're very welcome, Jason. All the best for everyone. 
I trust you enjoyed listening to the conversation as much as I enjoyed recording it. If you're enjoying the Big World Made Small podcast, please take a moment to tell the algorithm by subscribing and posting a review so that others can benefit as well. I also invite you to take a quick trip over to bigworldmadesmall.com and join our private adventure travel community to receive new episode notifications, special access to our guest experts, and perhaps even some exclusive partner offers that we haven't discussed on the podcast. I'll publish another episode soon. Until then, keep exploring. It's the best way to make a big world feel just a bit smaller. Thank you.